Hey, Power People. Welcome to Renewable Rides, powered by Vector. I'm Gareth Evans, the CEO and founder. And I'm Dan Roberts, head of sales. In each episode, we'll uncover the latest trends, learnings, challenges, and triumphs relating to the energy transition, on-site energy, and sustainability through the experiences of our inspiring guests and team here at Vector. So get ready for an exhilarating adventure into the fast-paced world of challenging limits, adapting purposely, and empowering co-creation to accelerate the energy transition with those that are on a mission to create a more resilient, profitable, sustainable, and thriving energy future. So let's go. All right, power people, and uh, welcome back to another episode of Renewable Rides. And Dan and I are joined again by James Coombs, our resident finance expert on the podcast, and has been bringing us some great insights into what's possible when it comes to financing on-site energy solutions. Um, James, do you want to just give a quick hello? Yeah, thanks for having me on. And specifically, as we get into this topic of different uh, tax credit-based financing, I'll just note that you know what what we do, uh, and as a product of experience working on the contractor side over the years, is uh, we function in building chemistry and as an intermediary between uh, investors. So in this case, we'll talk about primarily PPA investors uh, and also lease lease banks and lease institutions. The intermediary between them and contractors and customers. Uh, this is an area where it's not a commodity. Uh, and we used to say, you know, people who remember lending tree, you go online and you get 10 or 20 quotes for a mortgage and all that. This requires enough specificity and the structure and ongoing operation capabilities that it is definitely a focused and not a plain vanilla commodity kind of structure. And so facilitating that interface between all the parties involved uh, is a key part of uh, of what we do. And a key part of, if you're the contractor or developer or customer, a part of your due diligence should be understanding, hey, who are you uh, dealing with and how's that interface going to work? Good stuff. I think uh, as a quick recap of the last episode where we talked about tax credits, I think the big takeaway for me was um, I'm a business owner or leader, or I'm someone who's driving the deployment of on-site energy solutions at my facilities. As a business, do I have a tax burden that I want to offset with tax credits, which are now you know highly viable under the Inflation Reduction Act, 30% or more? So do I have a tax burden that I want to take advantage of? If so, um, I should get my finance and tax team involved early and often and make sure everyone's on the same page as to how we're going to go about it, what the opportunity is, and that we're not going to see any surprises as the project develops. And then the alternate to that is I want to take advantage of these great benefits, but I really don't want to do it in-house. So I'm going to go externally to someone who's going to finance the system for me, take advantage of these tax credits and just reduce the cost for me overall, but I don't have to worry about any of the internal wranglings of uh, tax filings or other. Um, So with that today, we're going to move past self-financing or taking advantage of those tax credits ourselves and talk about uh, power purchase agreements, or some people refer to them as energy as a service contracts. And James, I know this is uh, directly within your wheelhouse and would love to know uh, what is a PPA or power purchase agreement? Um, How do I get it? Um, What benefits does it bring to us? Yeah. So how do you get it being a key one? And let's focus that in on, uh, we'll talk, we'll call it underwriting. So much of what we talked about up to this point has been sort of qualifying the product type for the customer. Meaning, so for this segment, we're talking about uh, financing structures that monetize the tax credit. And we talked a lot about power purchase agreements. I want to highlight that for for for-profit commercial customers, uh, leasing may also be available and accomplishes essentially a similar uh, goal of capital provision and tax credit monetization. Now, let's also talk about kind of uh, qualifying the product back in the other direction, which is what customer types are appropriate for different investor types, PPA, investor, PPA provider, and leasing company types. So 
we have long-term assets and these are typically uh, long-term financing. So let's do a quick cut sheet. Here's what a PPA is. It's typically, it is a financing contract and it's typically gonna be a 20 or 25 year term. There are some states like New Jersey where we typically do 15 year terms or possibly Hawaii and we can talk about why, uh, but it's a long-term financing contract. And so uh, as much as I like the kind of uh, touch base with the tech world talking about solar as a service, uh, the important thing to remember here is it's still also think of it as a long-term lease. This isn't the kind of thing where you can put solar on your roof for two years, decide you don't want it anymore, cut off the service like you cut off your cable subscription and just go back to Netflix or whatever. Uh, it is a long-term provision, and that has implications for how these are underwritten. So as we talked about, first question off the bat, are we talking with the owners of real property? This is why. This is a, whether it's a PPA or a lease, or when we transfer over to the PACE and loan discussion next time, this is a long-term financing, uh, and we need to know that there's going to be value there, somebody who's going to be wanting to pay the bills because they're saving money 10 years, 15, 20 years from now. So that underwriting, uh, I'll just say it would not, I, I never want to pre-underwrite a customer and say, hey, if you're in this business, don't bother, because that's not the way it works, and there's you know, great customers in any business. But at a high level, we can note certain things that work better or work, you know, less well uh, with uh, debt leverage being being one of them, okay? Uh, and even maybe above that is time in business and sort of operating uh, stability or longevity or both. Uh, and this applies to both for-profits and uh, nonprofits that can be as subject to uh, the reason we finance so many nonprofits. And we used to say we approved probably four out of five of the houses of worship that we looked at was because they typically have been around for a long period of time and they have longstanding uh, leadership of those. And that makes them very easy to finance, put that same concept on the commercial side. And we're looking for uh, businesses that have some stability and a period of years of track record of operation to say, uh, and I think everybody gets this, hey, we're making the financing a loan or a PPA for you today. Do we have the visibility that you're going to be around in 10, 15, 20 years to pay the bill or, 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 you know, or buy it out and when it's economically viable for you to do so? Uh, and so that's the sort of reverse uh, direction of qualification we need to talk about. Uh, and I'll just say that high level, one thing I've noticed, I was just talking to a friend at a big, I'll say, a kind of corporate size provision of financing. And, you know, they noted they spend so much time on the front end, making sure they're getting qualified customers in their funnel and in their sales force, that it's not until the very end that an underwriter looks at it and says something simple like, hey, this customer doesn't own their property, or, you know, they've got some other hurdle in the way, we actually can't finance that. So a lot of times we can look at something and either immediately tell or have a quick conversation about, their situation to figure out, hey, either this isn't financeable or maybe we need to look at a specific financing tool that's built for a certain type of customer that who may be harder to finance, or we just need to peel the onion back a little bit in the earlier phases and maybe look at financials or talk about uh, their debt structure or something else. Do they have an SBA loan in place, whatever? that might give us a little better visibility. So just to say a little more front end kind of planning and conversation can create a big pivot rather than going down the road a long way and then finding out the structure that you were looking at, you actually can't get approved for because the concept of, hey, how do I get underwritten just never came up. Mm -hmm. So James, a lot of what you just talked about as far as underwriting, financial viability, like operational longevity. This is all coming into ultimately what the PPA price is, but um, maybe you can share a little bit with our listeners about the PPA itself. Like what is a typical or range of, of length of term? It's a, it's, a, it's a price per kilowatt hour. Well, give us just some of the basic kind yeah. of uh, components, if you will. Yes. Okay. So with those prefaces, here's what a power purchase agreement is. It's an agreement to purchase power. So you're the site ho, we call it the site host. You're the property owner. We're gonna build a solar installation on your roof or your parking lot or your ground. And by doing that, you are entering a long-term finance agreement. It's not a loan where you have a principal amount with interest and you're making a standard loan payment. 
you're paying for the power that's produced by the system. So over a period of 20 or 25 years, you're paying a per kilowatt hour rate. So there's a there's a vast simplicity to the to the uh, structure from a customer standpoint. Hey, you're going to pay 15 cents or 18 cents or 12 cents a kilowatt hour, and that rate will either be locked in, whether it's the same rate or at a stated increase every year for 20 or 25 years. You know ahead of time what you're going to pay for power. And so a typical uh, uh, three or four bullet point PPA term sheet will have a few key things you need to know. You know, what is that rate? What is, we often call it an escalator. What is that annual increase going to be? And what's that term of the PPA? And then the fourth one I like to add in there is, well, what happens at the end of that term? How do you get to ownership of the system at that point? Because the reality is the useful life of these is definitely going to be more than 20 years and even reality longer than 25 years. So how do you get to ownership at that point or sooner than that? Uh, those are the key points of a PPA. So what does that mean you know, functionally for a customer? A true PPA, and I would highlight that there are some products out there that I'd call more of a hybrid, where a true PPA, you are paying for power produced. And so that inherently has a guarantee baked into it, which is you typically think of a guarantee, which is, hey, if you buy this thing and it doesn't work, well, you'll get some money back. You buy a car battery and it works half the useful life, you'll effectively get half that value back. A PPA isn't like that because you're not coming out of pocket on the front end. It is typically, we call a zero down or a fully financed solution. And then the investor needs to ensure that that system produces power for the complete duration of the agreement in order to get paid. So are they responsible for monitoring? Yes, they need to know whether the system's operating. Customers will always have that data as well. And you know, there's a good symbiotic relationship. Customer calls up and says, hey, look, at my local school here, there's a couple of Frisbees up on top of the array. It's probably still fine, but hey, something's up with my array. You wanna take a look at it. Investor says, oh, thank you. Okay, great. That's impacting performance. We want to make sure you customer get as much electricity as you can because you're saving money on every kilowatt hour produced. We also want to make sure it's producing energy because we get paid on every kilowatt hour produced. And so we're responsible for cleaning it. Manufacturer warranties are incredibly long dated. Panel warranties these days <clears throat> are all 25 years. Inverter warranties are typically going to be 10 years, still a long time, but the uh, owner of the system knows that they're going to have to swap out inverters, and that's all factored into the PPA quote. So they're going to swap out those inverters when they begin to fail. Everything involved in ensuring a system produces optimally is the investor's uh, responsibility. And so, you know, that's part of why this isn't a commodity product with hundreds and hundreds of providers. And I'll highlight that depending on the sector you come from, you either consider a megawatt system to be very small or very large. Uh, so just to say that at the five megawatt level, uh, you're going to have a lot of kind of big uh, PPA investors uh, pursuing your project. At a megawatt or two, uh, in dollar terms, we'll say at a two, you know, four or five million dollar project, you're going to have you know, a decent number. And as you get down to, we've done a lot of smaller projects, 50, 100, 200 kilowatts, you're going to have a relatively limited group. And in fact, with interest rate and credit market shakeout happening fall 2023, as we speak, you're actually going to have a very limited group of uh, people, of investors who are able to do uh, that kind of structure as you get smaller. And again, that's because this isn't just the loan. This is actually operating a power plant that's in place on your property. Uh, so just encourage everyone, especially contractors and developers who are gatekeepers to the process, is have those conversations. Do your due diligence, whether you're talking to us uh, or Dan and Gareth or direct investors out there, uh, and make sure you're building chemistry with an investor that can accommodate and has a track record doing your specific types and size and locations of projects. Yeah, I love it. So I think... The way my simple mind works is if I don't want to be at the 
risk of my utility constantly escalating my power rates year on year and that being completely out of my control. It could be 10% this year, 30% next year. If I want to hedge my energy costs and lock them in long term, there still may be an escalator, but it's completely transparent to you. It's agreed up front. That's the opportunity here, isn't it? And yeah. you don't have to worry about operating the asset. It's just energy is sold to you. You're replacing your utility bill for essentially another bill with an agreed rate, uh, correct? It's a great, yeah. It's really, I'm glad you asked and focused on the escalator concept specifically. And again, that's the specified annual percentage that that kilowatt hour rate increases. Um, you know, I always like doing 0% escalators. It's simple to just say, hey, look, you're going to pay 14 cents and that rate's locked in for all the power for 20 years. It doesn't mean an escalator is bad. It just means it's easy yeah. to explain. Um, but I think it was uh, Sunrun 10 years ago used to use the water balloon kind of example, which is, okay, great. If we have an escalator, you can kind of squeeze the initial rate a little bit lower, but the other end of the water balloon gets bigger. So it's basically a way to sort of get the customer a little bit lower payment in the earlier years, and they're going to have a higher payment in the later years. Why would we do that? Well, all of the investors, certainly that, that, that we work with, want to ensure the customer has a viable savings proposition. And that's why I'd highlight on all of these we're going to get a rate that's delivering the customer. Typically, we're looking to get them at least the 10% margin of savings, although for some of these big ag customers or Northern California, or actually San Diego and, and SCE as well, sometimes we're even getting 25 or 30% margins of savings. Yeah. And we want to make sure if it is a narrower margin of savings, that even from the early years, the customer is going to have that savings. A customer, no matter how credit worthy they are, a customer that's saving money is more likely to pay their bill. But we're also going to be capping that escalator. So in my view, you never really want to go above a 2% escalator. Uh, and I'd argue in many cases, again, you want to try to keep it as close to zero as possible so that over the long term, 10, 15 years from now, hey, will your PG&E or SCE rates have gone up an average of 4 or 5% a year? Yeah, probably. Uh, so you can be hopefully comfortable that your 1% or 2% escalator will still be delivering a large margin of savings down the road. But that's why escalators are used. Uh, it's not just like, hey, I can keep the same PPA rate and offer you 0% or 3%. Again, it's just that equation so that we're getting you a little bit more savings on the front end, typically on a deal that's uh, a little tighter from a margin of savings standpoint. Le if I can quickly pivot to make sure we also talk about leasing. Um, tax leasing, as we talked about before the show, has been around for decades and decades. It's what large companies, I always know airlines have done uh, to transfer taxable income to asset owners that can take the most advantage of it. Uh, and so this is a long, uh, this is a financial product with a long history. Leasing can be done for solar. Solar assets are typically viewed as pretty small uh, by the big banks that do leases. So when we're getting up to the two, $3 million range, it starts to open up the window a little bit to bring in uh, lease banks. Uh, at the smaller levels, it's a very, what I would say at a minimum, it's a very customized and localized product. You'll have some banks that are, say, California banks or New Jersey banks that might have specific ability to do it just in that state. But it is good, to, whereas PPAs tend to be offered in kind of all the major solar states, California, Arizona, Hawaii, New Jersey, and the Northeast, just to kind of name a few. So, but it's an important distinction because I think leasing for a lot of for-profit commercial customers, not nonprofit customers, not nonprofits, but for for-profits is also a good uh, solution for implementing solar. So I just wanted, I want to make sure we got that, that into the PPA topic. Yeah, nice. And can you maybe, similar to breaking down some of the components of a, of a PPA, can you break down just some of the key components of a lease that, that, uh, that our listeners should be thinking about? Yeah. Uh, to oversimplify just a little bit, a lease and the PPA are similar in that they provide capital and monetize the tax credit. Uh, a PPA, you're paying based on kilowatt hours. A lease, you just have a fixed payment. Sometimes you have a lease with an escalator, but typically just a fixed payment for a period of time. Leases tend to be uh, between seven and 10 years, so they can go out a little bit longer term sometimes if the customer credit's sufficient, whereas PPAs will virtually always be 15 to 20, possibly 25 years. 
And with the PPA, the entire system performance for life is wrapped into that financing. So there is a lot more expected sort of operational cost baked into that. Uh, and so it would be a little oversimplified, but in concept, a lease is for those customers that are comfortable uh, taking that sort of risk of ownership, that responsibility of making sure the system produces, whereas the PPA is really more of a, a full wrap. And as the customer, your primary responsibility is to make sure uh, just that you don't have people going up and, for example, walking around on the roof and messing with it uh, for no for no reason. Yeah. Can you, um, both on PPAs, and maybe it's even more relevant on the lease, given the shorter term, the seven to 10 years, as you mentioned, talk a little bit about, I've, I've received several questions recently from customers saying, great, does that mean I get to own it at the end of this term? Does that mean, and you mentioned yeah. those that are that are taking on the lease structure are, are assuming some of the longer term risk, but they're also taking on the longer term benefit in many cases. So talk to us about yeah. kind of end of term. It's all driven. This is all driven, by the way, tax law and investment tax credit incentives are written. Uh, so in outside the U.S., you're going to have very different parameters at play here. But the concept in the U.S. is when you're doing any financing where you are taking the tax credit is there's some concept of uh, risk of ownership. So these are all highly structured. We're really trying to focus on the customer and contractor developer facing aspects of this. But the reason for some of this structure exists because we're all working very closely with tax lawyers and tax professionals to build on approved, uh, you know, viable structures to comply with tax credit law and tax law in general. I say that because it means at the end of tax credit financing, depending on the term, uh, you're typically going to have some concept of a minimum buyout. Some will call that a fair market value buyout. Some will call that a residual. Uh, but as you go longer and longer and longer, particularly as you get to the warranty life for the useful life of the system, that expected fair market value uh, will, will, will go lower and lower. And so typically, that's the reason we can do long-term financing is these things have such long warranties. Um, but you're going to get out there and as you get further along at it, 20 or 25 years, you're going to have relatively low buyouts. But if you wanted, for example, an early buyout or a termination for convenience in a PPA or lease, you're going to have substantial um, buyout costs. That's why I typically highlight in the first six years, you really should have no expectation of buying out a tax credit product. Uh, the tax credit rules basically make that prohibitively expensive. Uh, and then this is where I would say, and this is where we spend a lot of time building kind of chemistry and understanding. It's that period in between there where... I'll just say one person's fair market value is not another person's fair market value. I have seen some contracts that take five pages outlining a process for getting to a fair market value. Uh, it's not necessarily bad. It's just a lot. I've also seen some where it says the investor and their sole discretion will determine that fair market value. Uh, and then a more kind of general, what I consider fair or being fair to both sides approach to say, hey, there's going to be this mutual determination approach where if we can agree on fair market value, we'll agree. If we can't, maybe we'll get an appraisal. It doesn't take five pages to spell that out. But as you get to some large projects, you can see why it would take more. So I would just encourage customers to ask that question that when it comes time to buy out, how will that work? That's also why it's difficult to specify a dollar value buyout, especially in that period from kind of year five to 10 or 15, is there is some, again, tax law coming into play here that you need to have a concept of fair market value. It's possible to set that value high enough that it's going to be deemed fair market value. But so typically, some kind of a determination process is in the customer's benefit uh, to say, hey, look, uh, we don't want to commit to a high value. We want to get something fair while still compliant with, with tax law. It may seem wonky, I acknowledge, but when you're trying to get exit that agreement, having that visibility for what that's going to look like is very important because it's not a simple principal schedule pay down at any point in time. Yep. And last question, James, I assume if I'm a CFO or CEO and I'm I'm excited about a PPA, but maybe not for 20, 25 years. Um, 
what's the shortest you've seen? Yeah. And is there the option essentially to have a bigger buyout number for a shorter term lease to kind of compensate the, the final? It's a good question. Um, way I would think about it is, if you think about the water balloon analogy is, well, how, what are the different ways we can kind of structure that water balloon to get to the short term? So it could be just a higher rate, pay a higher rate over a shorter term. Uh, if there's a subsidy in place like there is in New Jersey, that also impacts the term of the PPA. If a customer has appetite, we've done a lot of projects for some of our house of worship customers that want to put some money down up front to get to a lower uh, PPA rate. So there are different ways that we can accommodate uh, some of those uh, some of those considerations uh, for those customers. They yeah, don't want to have that long term or where the economics are so attractive that you don't need to go 20 years to make it cash flow or 25 years. Maybe we can make it cash flow on a 15 year term uh, and do some other things to uh, to check those boxes. Same with a lease where we have flexibility to go. Basically, seven years is the kind of shortest because uh, it complies nicely with the tax credit periods. But yeah, those are all good good considerations. That's great. Um, I really appreciate that. So in summary, I'm a business leader. I'm excited about my energy project. If I want to have kind of perceived ownership, I can go with a, a leasing model. I can borrow the money. I can um, pay it off probably over a shorter time frame and then own the asset at the end of it. But I'm responsible for maintaining it, operating it, or I have to find someone to do that. Alternatively, I can get someone to completely take it off my hands. I can hedge my energy costs. I can lock in, save between 10 and 30% of my bill and um, have the option to retain the asset at the end of the, the term. Um, super exciting. I think it really unlocks a lot of options for business leaders and um, it makes these systems extremely viable, accessible and um, very profitable. So Appreciate the the insights, James, and excited to talk about pace financing on the next one. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. One thing I just wanted to highlight is I always throw this in there is just do your due diligence or in plain English, just ask questions because yeah. there are a lot of companies and sometimes contractors and developers that can do this and finance it for you. Uh, but there are also cases, especially in this market, where the developer is doing a lot of work behind the scenes and you want to make sure you're working with somebody who has that kind of experience. So never be uh, hesitant to ask to read contracts uh, or ask for uh, product project track record and things like that, uh, projects in the ground and funded. It's good help. Uh, it's good information for particularly for customers to make sure they get the execution that they're expecting. Yeah, I love that. And candidly, that's why we've built Vector is to make sure that um, business leaders are asking the right questions to the market and they've got transparency around what their options are, what they should be thinking about, who's responsible for what, what the pros and cons of each model are. And so I really appreciate you calling that out because it's it's up to us to empower people to simplify this process, but make sure they're doing their due diligence and feeling really confident to act. So um, awesome session. Thanks, James. Thanks, Dan. We receive a lot of questions from business leaders around the world wanting to learn more about the energy transition, what is possible and where to start. So to help you stay informed and up to date on best practices, opportunities, risks and success stories, we created an industry news feed at vector.com forward slash news with all our podcasts, blogs and newsletter. Check it out and connect with Dan, myself and the Vector team to learn more. Cheers and have a good one.